Our final guest this afternoon is an award-winning actress and single mother who also is a breast cancer survivor. She portrayed tough as nails characters in the wildly successful television show The Sopranos and Nurse Jackie and overcame her own real life battle for survival. To share her journey, please welcome Edie Falco with Ariana Huffington. Thank you so much for being here to actually close these two days. What a better, there's no better way than having you here. I'm happy to be here. Uh, beyond everything that you've done, you have actually won a Best Actress Emmy for both drama and comedy. So I think we're going to cover everything in our conversation. <laughs> well, we have drama 20 minutes. Drama and comedy, yes. <laughs> Why don't we start with drama? Since this is a health conference and um, you're a cancer survivor, why don't we go back to that day in 2003 when you got your cancer diagnosis and you went straight back to work? Yeah. Yeah, that was a rough one. Um, I, let's see, I had the biopsy that, uh, in the morning and uh, was told that day that uh, they had found cancer. And I, I remember I had to be at work at one. And you know, it's, you go into some hyper-reality. You know, the way you remember things during time, times like that is not like anything else. So it was very, it was very, I remember exactly what scene we shot and um, wanting to say what was going on, but also knowing I wasn't going to tell anybody. So it was very, it was surreal. And then, um the first big decision you made um, after you went into remission a year later was to adopt a child, <laughs> which is what every cancer survivor does, right? <laughs> what made you decide that at that particular moment? Well, it's the fact that I was a cancer survivor. That's what it was, that um, previous to uh, being diagnosed, I, 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 sort of, I guess I never really thought I'd have kids. Um, but I had been in a number of relationships where it looked like that was where we were headed. And then the cancer thing kicked in and, uh, and I was single. And I realized, I mean, once I realized I wasn't gonna die from it, um, it really was like a light going on. Like, oh, I have, I have to do this now. I gotta, I gotta get on this, you know? So I, I, uh, I had known uh, uh, Rosie O'Donnell, who told me, well, if you want to adopt, let me know. I'll tell you how to do it. And then that's how it all started. So sort of, I love that, because it's like saying, this is important to me, and I'm not going to wait um, to have the perfect man in my life, or to have a bigger house, or anything. It was just time. And so you now have two children, 14 and 11. Right. And backstage in the green, green room, I heard you talk to them because you are flying back to New York to be with them and, and saying to them, no, I'm not bringing you anything this time. <laughs> you brought us a present, right? <laughs> anyway, no, they're I, very cute. I identify. So another anniversary that you celebrated last weekend was sobriety, 27 years. Yeah. So you see drama and comedy. So what was that journey? <laughs> That's the comedy part, I guess. What was that journey like? You know, um, I had gone to college with a bunch of uh, um, <laughs> alcoholics, really, but a bunch of <laughs> actors. And there was a lot of partying, and it was all fun and games. But then when we all left college, some of us were, were not able to put it away. And I come from a long line of uh, addicts in my family. Um, and uh, it became clear pretty quickly that this was already had grabbed me, you know, had a hold on me. And a lot of my friends got sober first. They were showing me, without showing me, they were showing me a different life without alcohol. And they kind of walked me through it in the early days. And now most of my very closest friends are sober people. And your ritual is to go to AA on your anniversary. Yeah. But what other rituals have sustained you? Um, 
Well, going to AA for a long time was very important to me, and that shifted for me over the years. Uh, I, don't, I bet you it would be great to go back, but I have other things. I'm in therapy. I've been in therapy for a very long time. Huge part of my life, huge help to me on many levels, but I'm also a Buddhist where meditation's a big part of my life and the rituals and the prayers that we have within the, um, within the, uh, the classes that I take. Um, very, very meaningful. We, are, we appear to be a species where ritual has some meaning and importance, or I will speak for myself that I do. So it's interesting because a Buddhist monk, Thich Nhat Hanh, said something very meaningful about our growing addiction to technology, mm. which we've been talking about this afternoon. He said it has never been easier to run away from ourselves. Oh, for sure. And so in a sense, by creating these rituals, you stay connected with your, yourself and what has meaning. I'm so glad I was born when I was because we didn't have the option of finding these other ways to disappear. My kids were born with the eye something in their hand, you know. That's all they know. Making eye contact feels like oh, they're, you know, they suddenly realize there's another human in the room, you know. So how do you feel about that as a parent? I am of many minds about it. Uh, you know, I could be one of those people with it. My kids don't have TV. They don't have any of the I. But you know what? They're growing up in a culture where everybody has them. And they do their homework on I, iPads at school. And uh, their, home, uh, their um, uh, class assignments are on them. And all, the, all uh, communication takes place. I, I don't know. But as I was saying to you before, that I can't ask, you know, my elders, like, oh, how did it go when I was a kid? I got away from all that technology, right? You know what I mean? Like, we're just, we're trying to find our way. Me and all the parent groups at, at my kid's school, talking about it all the time, try to set limits, and then they have this thing where you can, you know, guide what they stay. It's, it's very, very hard. It's basically what I'm saying. It's hard and it's complicated. And it's hard for us, too, because you are in a profession where your energy is regularly summoned to be somewhere to perform on somebody else's schedule. Mm. So how do you recharge yourself? Well, the, the biggest thing is that um, it still shocks me that I get to do what I get to do for a living because it is something I so cherish. Uh, I just, I love it and I feel like every day feels like a, I'm a beginner because there's so many new things to learn about what I do. Um, so I think the fact that I love this, uh, what I have to do to, to, to be there and perform, it seems irrelevant because I know how many people I love, actor friends of mine who aren't working, who are going through a rough time, people who've spent years and years in this business and just haven't caught a break. I'm the luckiest of the lucky. So I, and I'm also a little, I'm a nerd. I'm a very good employee. So like I show up when I'm supposed to show up <laughs> and I'm prepared and I, you know, and I have a, a really, really, really good life. What you said reminds me of something you said in an interview, how gratitude is, is a regular practice for you and you never take things for granted. I mean, in AA, they talk about an attitude of gratitude. And back when I was first hearing these things, you know, I was rolling my eyes because everything rhymed and it was making me nuts. But, uh, and it was also felt like something I had to work at. It was not where my brain went. I was, you know, raised by a certain type of individual, you know, we're New Yorkers and, you know, the Italians from Brooklyn. It's like, we don't walk around like, I'm so grateful. <laughs> but, <laughs> but for whatever reason, through therapy, but mostly, I would, and AA and, and Buddhism, that you have a choice as to how you want to face each day. And someplace along the line, very organically, I wake up and I can't believe, first of all, I survived cancer, for heaven's sake, you know? I'm, how many women I know my age that were diagnosed with cancer, they came to me knowing I'd been through it, and I said, listen, go to do whatever you're supposed to do. One day, you, the day will come when you won't even think about it, and they all died. Those women did not make it through. Mm -hmm. They have not had the same journey as me. I'm sitting here on a stage in San Diego, you know what I mean? I'm, how could you not be grateful? I would imagine it would take energy to find something other than that. So it's kind of interesting, because this, everything you are saying is really ancient wisdom, but it's validated by modern science. We had a panel this afternoon with Professor Leanne Williams, who's done a lot of research 
on the depressed and anxious brain and how one of the pathways that leads to, to depression or anxiety is negative bias. Mm. And in a sense, gratitude, even though we can roll our eyes and mm -hmm. say gratitude, you know, uh, is actually an intervention mm. to stop negative bias, to stop you becoming depressed about sure. your life. And sometimes it really is by the numbers. You know, people were given uh, tasks, such as before you go to bed, you make a list of five yes. things you're grateful for. And it's, you know, again, you kind of kick and scream, but after a while it becomes habit. And it's a place your brain goes to more habitually. So let's talk about a few other possible recharging tools that we can all learn from. What about your sleep? You know, <laughs> I was always ashamed of the fact that I need a certain amount of, a certain amount of sleep. And I'm, I'm, I'm a morning person. I'm really not a night person. And I go to bed early. You know, I have ki kids who go to school. I'm up with them. And, uh, you know, I'm in bed really early, and I, I no longer uh, make fun of myself yes. because I need to get enough well, sleep. Well, again, science validates you. Thank goodness. I love the story of when your son jumped into bed with you when you were sleep deprived and what you did. <laughs> you know, uh, but uh, yeah. When they were little, you know, I mean, now you can't wake them up. It's time for school and you can't get them out of bed. But, uh, you know, it used to be they were up as soon as the sun came up. And I, my son is so beautiful. He's such a handsome little boy. He was laying down and he, his little head came up to my head. I mean, that's how little he was. I think I said, uh, I think I said, if you don't go back to bed, I'm going to throw you down the stairs. I think that's what I said. <laughs> I know that he left. <laughs> and when I woke up, I thought, no, I didn't. No, did I really say that? <laughs> and I went and apologized to him. And, you know, we've gotten, we're, we're through that chapter and on to many others. But uh, After 20 years of therapy, he will deal with that's it. That's right. He's already about six years in, so, yeah. <laughs> So you don't do social media, mm -mm. which is rare for an incredibly successful actor like you. Tell us why. I just never did. I don't know. It's not, uh, I'm not, I'm, I don't think I'm addicted to my phone, only in so far as being a single mom with two kids and needing to know where they are and all that stuff. But um, again, we, I had a lot of practice being a person before those phones came along. So <laughs> I... Uh, you know, I, I watch my daughter, you know, she's growing up with the, all the same things that every mother's talked about who has a daughter coming of age in this time of the, the, uh, the apps that fix the way you look and all this stuff. And I just, I, I don't believe that anything I've ever gotten in my life was as a result of the way I look or the way I presented myself to someone. Uh, um, and uh, I feel like if I start to do social media, I, that maybe I'm not that I start to believe otherwise? I don't know, maybe that doesn't make sense. I'm lazy, that's what it is, really. <laughs> I think it makes a lot of sense. I hope you're right about it, because as, as we're facing the crisis of uh, young girls, um, pre-teen and teen, um, committing suicide in unprecedented numbers, uh, depressed and anxious, Social media is playing a huge role. For it's exactly sure. what you said. The For comparisons, sure. how you look, what party you haven't been invited to. Yeah, it's uh, it is very troubling. And I, you know, I I remember being a teenager or preteen. Like there's very little I'm going to say to my daughter. Well, she'd be like, "Gosh, mom, thank you. I didn't think of that." You know, <laughs> they're just they're not. She's not listening. She's like, you know. So I do what I can to try to tell her my thoughts about this, but be gentle, knowing she's going to go through this the way she goes through it, and tell her that you're beautiful, you're beautiful without makeup, and, you know, no, I'm not bringing you a present home. <laughs> <laughs> so let us end on uh, the afterlife. Mm. Don't you think that's a good topic? I think topic we all do end on the afterlife. On which to end a health conference? <laughs> so... You've said how being a Buddhist, being a Buddhist has actually helped you manage your whole life. And one of the reasons is that a belief in the afterlife is part of Buddhism. And so it's given you more of a peace of mind. Tell us more. Well, you know, it's, I'm, I'm 25 years into my studies of Buddhism and I'm still scratching the surface. It's really a fascinating, philosophy really based in science 
But uh, one of the things that you are taught, and I really struggled with for a long time, is the idea that consciousness is, is ongoing. Since beginning was time, it will continue on long after this body is dead. And you know, for all the, I, I didn't discipline myself to believe it, but over the years, it just makes more sense than anything I'd ever heard. And something else I also have come to realize is everything that we believe at some point in our lives, we made a decision to believe that, whether or not we know it, whether or not it was conscious. Our parents said, you know, that family over there is mean. And so we like, oh, okay, that family's mean. And that just became part of your belief system. But at some point, it was a decision. I have, however unconsciously, decided to believe in the idea of an ongoing consciousness. And as a result of the decision I made, my life has changed for the better. Is it true? Can anyone say for sure that they know? You know, I, I don't know that I can answer that. But because of the beliefs that I have, the quality of my day-to-day -day life is better. I completely understand that because um, um, as the Onion headline put it recently, death rate holds steady at 100%. <laughs> We're all I headed think out. This, this may change after this conference, but <laughs> given that that's the case, it makes a big difference in terms of putting problems in perspective. Totally. Um, in terms of how we approach everything in our lives. And the idea of like, yeah, you just do whatever you want and go crazy because you're all going to die in the end, but then you're born again. <laughs> and you got to deal with the mess you made. You know what I mean? Uh, uh, psychically. That, you know, imagine if you're aiming towards something higher, like how would you behave differently today? Mm -hmm. And it's actually connected with um, the big conversation we've had here about AI and machine learning and data. And uh, as they become more and more dominant, the one thing that we humans uniquely have are our ability to be compassionate and empathetic. Mm and all the things that machines are never going to be. They may right. be more intelligent than we are, but they're not going to be more loving than we right. are. Right. I am a little concerned about Pixar movies, though, I have to say. You are? Well, they're going to put me out of business, I have no doubt. Like I, <laughs> my children love them, like Cars and any of those. Pixar movies are so, they have so uh, specifically and, and, uh, and fastidiously been able to match the expressions of a human going through sadness, let's say, like the little eye movements and like a little dot of what looks like their eyes welling up. And here I am in the audience as a grown woman crying at a car who's upset because he <laughs> ran out of gas or whatever it is. They're, they've gotten really, really good. You know, I mean, I don't, but it is based on the experience of a, of a, of a living, breathing, compassionate human. Right. But it's, it's not a human on, on the screen, so it's complicated stuff. It's complicated, but we want to end on an optimistic. Oh, yes, but, but <laughs> there'll always be commercials. <laughs> and also, there will always be Edie Falco bringing us home with uh, humor and wisdom. And I can't thank you enough on behalf of all of us. Thank I'm happy you. to be here. Thank you. Thank you.